In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you give God a hand this morning? I'm going to tell you, as we, as we begin our, our series this morning, of, uh, it's called Battle Cry. It's the, it's the, the what, we're, what we're talking about, I'm going to go ahead and tell you why, where that title came from and, and why we're calling it Battle Cry. And, and if you read all throughout Scripture, it's not just an Old Testament thing. How many of you know what happened with Paul and Silas when they were in prison? They began to praise God and sing to Him and worship Him. And what happened? Chains began to break. Prison bars began to fall. People got saved. A revival started. A family got, came back to Jesus all because somebody was willing to put their feelings aside and worship God for who he is it's our battle cry you see it in the Old Testament we see it in we see it in with Joshua when they when they walked around the city of Jericho they God told them said march around the city of Jericho and then blow the trumpet and when you blow the trumpet let out can you might tell me what that said let out a what a loud shout so we say all the time old volume don't matter to God I'm just telling you that he told Joshua and his army to let out a loud shout Let out a loud shout, and when you do, the walls will fall. It's a shout of praise. If you really dive into that, I love the fact that the Lord told them, and and Joshua and the soldiers, they took the ram's horn. Somebody ought to say amen when I get done with this this morning. Okay, They took the ram's horn. You see, back then, there there were two to three different types of horns that they used. There was a silver horn that they would blow to announce that something's happening. There was a ram's horn that they would blow to announce victory over an enemy. I love the fact that in most situ- in all situations, the people would blow the silver horn to announce that they're declaring war on another country or another nation. But what I love about this is they blew the ram's horn. Because there was no announcing war against Jericho. The victory had already been won. There wasn't no battle because God was involved. He said, blow the ram's horn because I'm giving you the victory. March and let out a loud shout because the victory is yours. I hope this morning that we can stand on God's word and know that that, that God has provided the victory. Can I tell you that everything that you need in your life is Jesus? Can I say it? You're you're worried about the bills that you've got to pay tomorrow? Call on his name. Obey his word. Your your marriage and, and you're feeling discouragement and maybe your marriage isn't what it needs to be. Can I tell you that Jesus is the answer? Can I tell you that Jesus is the answer? I believe that Jesus is the answer to every problem. Jesus. And and, and I believe that, and I believe that the victory is provided. So therefore, this morning when I worship, this morning when I'm standing on this front pew, I call on his name, and I praise him because I believe that the victory is already mine. Because the word of God says so. So we talk, we talk about battle cry. Why is it called battle cry? Well, we see Joshua. When he marched around the city, we see, we see Paul and Silas. We see King Jehoshaphat when, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 20 when, when he told the people to get into their position and they got into positions of worship and, and of praise. And it literally says when the people began to worship that God set ambushes on the enemy. Well, I can read to you in Isaiah that the, the word about when, the hand, when people began to clap It says when people begin to clap, it was a disdain on the enemy. That's one of the reasons why I like to clap. I want to clap this morning. Can I I say this? Uh, I have freedom this morning, right? If if, if, If President Trump walked right in that door... It don't matter if you like him or not. If President Trump walked in that door and come up on stage, every one of y'all would begin to clap. But we don't even clap and stand up for the presence of God. We will cl- if 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 a if a if a if a major league baseball player that we all know walked in that door we'd all clap for him, but some reason we believe that it's not normal to clap for Jesus, <laughs> and we get uncomfortable. You see, I, if if I'm going to usher the presence of somebody that's famous in, I'm gonna, I want to usher the presence of God into this place this morning. Can you do that with me? Let's just clap. Let's say, Lord, you're welcome here. We praise you. There's power behind it. In the, over the next few weeks, I'm going to tell you why we worship the way we worship. Why we praise the way we praise. What it means, what we do, what's going on. When, when I raise my hands, what does it mean? When I clap, what does it mean? When I shout, what does it mean? We're going to talk about the difference between worship and praise. Because praise is a form of worship, but not all worship is praise. 
You see, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about when we say praise and worship, we, all, we automatically think about the, the, the worship team and, and coming to church and worshiping him and praising him and singing, all of this stuff. We, we think about our personal preference. We think about all these different things. I'm here to tell you this morning that worship, while praise is worship, there are many different ways to worship God. And we'll see it, we'll talk about it, we'll say why, how we worship, why we praise, why we as Christians, as Pentecostals, as Assembly of God, as SFA, why we worship and praise the way we do. Over the next few weeks, we will be with, look, look, look at me again with Psalm 47. They're going to put it up there on the screen. Psalm 47, verses 1 through 6. Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. Notice this. Go back to that for me real quick. Notice what he says. Shout to God with cries of joy. Can't, where does joy come from? It comes from your heart. You see, worship comes from the heart. If I'm here just worshiping because the music's good and my heart's not in it, I'm worshiping in vain. I'm worshiping who he is. It says, clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. We're joyful because of who he is, because of what he's done, because of his promises. Look at verse 2. For the Lord Most High is awesome, the great king over all the earth. He subdued nations under us, peoples under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loved. God has ascended amid shouts of joy. The Lord amid the sounding of trumpets. Sing praises to God. Sing praises. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. You see, when I read that, I, I've already said it this morning once because it's just on my spirit. I want to be a Psalm 47 preacher. Can I tell you, I don't want to be a preacher that just, that just runs around as an emotional, but I want to be joyful and I want to be happy and I want to be energetic for who God is. And this morning, I hope, I hope that you will say the same thing, that you want to be a Psalm 47 daddy, that you want to be a Psalm 47 mom, that you want your kids to see you worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that you want to see, you, you, can I tell you that what one generation allows, the next will do in excess. And so many times, I'm telling y'all this morning, I, I love, there's some sermons every once in a while, I'm just, I know that there's, I'm going to say some stuff this morning, so just know I love us, love y'all, Okay. But can I say this, that so many times we get so hard on the younger generation about how they don't want to worship Jesus. But can I tell you, they learned it from somebody. When we are unwilling to worship God, and we're unwilling to, to, to pour our heart out to Him, we cannot expect the next generation to do the same. We need to be people of, we need to be Psalm 47 Christians. I'm not saying, listen, you, you know me by now. I'm not telling you it's not about emotion. I'm not telling you to run and jump pews and, 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 and hang from chandeliers of everything you've said. It, it looks different for everybody. But we, what, what I'm saying there in Psalm 47 is that I want to be a man who is comfortable pouring out my heart to Jesus. Who is comfortable crying out to the Savior of the world. Crying out to the one who died on the cross for me. I want to be comfortable in that. I, I want my kids one day to know that their dad was a Psalm 47 dad. You know, I think about, you see men, there are men in this room, myself included. There are men in this room that are Psalm 47 men that are going to raise their hands and they're going to worship. And some, sometimes we, some people may think, well, why do they do that? Why do they raise their hands and worship? Let me tell you why. Because there was a day that they were living in addiction. There was a day when they didn't know God. There was a day when they didn't feel like there was a hope or a future. Their life was dark. But because they found Jesus, everything in their life is different. And now they have something to worship about. If we don't feel like this morning that we got something to worship Jesus about, then we don't really know him. When we know him... It is to worship him. You see, worship comes from the heart. Grace, mercy, transformation, the cross, the blood. Worship comes from the heart. This leads us into our series. Before we get into the series of why we worship the way we do, I believe that there's a proper starting point. I believe that we need to start with the heart. Why do, what, can I ask you this? What is worship? What, what, we talk about worship, I'm not, I, and I want to I I separate that from praise right now. We're talking about worship, because there's different times of worship. So what is worship? What does worship look like? 
What's the simple definition? Let me tell you like this. Worship is this, right here, two words. Love expressed. That's worship. Worship. Love expressed. Why, why, why do I lift my hands? Why do I sing? Why do I clap? Because I love the Lord, and I love Jesus, and I want everybody to know it. It's that simple. You see, if, if we have love for something, but we don't express it, it's not worship. If we, if we express through words something, but don't have love for that, that thing, it's not worship. You may say, well, it's still expression. What did Jesus say? Jesus told the Pharisees, he said, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. Your lips worship me, but your hearts are far from me. He said, you, you, you may be saying the right things, you may be singing the songs, but your heart don't love me. And then what was his next statement? He said, you worship me in vain. Because I can go through the motions, but if my heart is not in it, it's not worship. It's a picture. You see, let me, let me and I'm going to say, listen, this, this morning, worship comes in all forms and sizes. Okay, I'm not, I'm not at any, I'm, I am, because it, it has to do a little bit with our personality. It's easy for me, because I'm outgoing and loud, it's easy for me to worship and not worry about it. Some people are, I, I'm, not, I'm not telling you this morning, you worship in your own way. But can I tell you this, I want you to think about this with me. If I'm gone for two weeks, so say I go on a hunting trip, it's the first thing that comes to mind. I just, that sounds great. Let's say I go on a hunting trip for two weeks, I'm gone. And all of a sudden, I, I come back, and I show back up, and, and I come back to my, my wife, and, and I surprise her at, ha- at, the, at the house. Can I tell you that if I walk in the front door of my home, and my wife is there, and I haven't seen her in two weeks, what do you think is going to happen if I walk in and do this right here? I'm going to be in trouble. But, but, but what if I said this? What if I said this? What if I went? Oh. Sweetie, you know my heart. You know my heart. Of course I love you. What's going to happen? I'm going to be sleeping on the couch, Andy. I'm going to be sleeping on the couch. Because let me tell you why. Because when I love somebody, we need to express it. It doesn't mean that I open up the door and come in screaming, Jennifer, I'm home. And, but, but let me tell you what I'm going to do. Stand up. If I haven't seen her in two weeks, I'm going to wrap my arms around her. I'm going to tell her I love her. We may shed a tear. I kiss her on her forehead. I tell her how much I love her and how awesome she is. Why? Because my love for her needs to be expressed. Can I tell you that our love for God is the same way? We need to express it. We need to express it. That's what worship and praise is all about expressing love for the one who gave up his life for you. Sometimes we complicate it. Sometimes we complicate what worship and what praise is. But I'm telling you this morning that worship is simply love expressed. Love expressed. I want to show a video. Show this. Watch this video real quick. About 35 seconds. Okay, now, you guys, you guys already know how much I love sports. So this is not hammering sports at all, but I do want to say this. We see that, and because I've been there, I've done that, and because I love the name on the front of a jersey, I'm willing to act like that and stand up and do whoop pig suey and scream and holler and get all excited and pumped up. And can I tell you that that's normal? <laughs> That's normal. If you went to a game, you wouldn't look at nobody crazy because they acted like that right there. But at the same time, we come to church to worship the one who died on the cross, who has guaranteed me an eternity in heaven, who shed his blood and wiped away all of my mess-ups, wiped away all of my transgressions. Now I live in freedom because of what he did. And if somebody gets excited, we look at them like they're weird. Something's, Something's backwards. Can I say it? Something's backwards. 
When, when, we, when we go, oh, man, it's perfectly normal to take your shirt off and paint it on your chest and act a fool at a ball game on Saturday, but then we show up on Sunday morning, and if somebody raises their hand and says amen really loud, oh, they are weird. Can I tell you, I got something to praise God about this morning. It's a whole lot better than that football game. <laughs> Love expressed. That's all it is. You see, what you just saw right there, that's nothing crazy. I go to the games, I act the same way. But what are they doing? They're expressing their love they have for the Razorbacks. It's that simple. They're expressing the love that they have for the Hogs, for the Razorbacks. It's normal. So many times you see we worship, we worship teams, we worship things in our life, we worship, uh, we, hey, I coached the Little League team this year and I got just as excited when we hit a home run as anybody. But we worship ball teams. We worship so many things in our life. We worship the name that's on the front of the jersey. Sometimes we worship the name that's on the back of the jersey. But we have an opportunity to worship the name above all names that did something for you that no sports team ever can. It worries me sometimes that, that that's normal. But when we get excited over Jesus, we're weird. Worship is a heart thing way before it's an expressive thing. You see, the reason, the reason those, those fans right there are going nuts is because they love the Razorbacks with all their heart. <laughs> you see, the reason why I go nuts is because my dad took me to Bud Walton Arena when I was four years old. It was the biggest mistake he ever made. He took me to Bud Walton Arena back when the Hogs were good, <laughs> about 1993. If you can do the math, you know when they won the title. We were good. And he took me to Bud Walton Arena, and I've never been the same since. I'm diehard. I love them. I act crazy, I act ignorant, I, I do all these things, I express my love for them. But can I tell you, I also, my heart also met Jesus, and he changed me, and he left me not the same. And I am so thankful that my life is different because of what he did on the cross. And if it's okay with you, I just want to worship him. I just want to say thank you, God. Thank you, Lord, for what you did in my heart and in my life. We love you, Lord. But before we get into any of that, I told you there was, a, I believe, a proper place to start. And I believe that the first form of worship is a responsive heart. Can I say that? The first form of worship is a responsive heart. If I believe that as a, as a if, if I sit in on, in on a church pew and I hear, and this has happened to me plenty of times in my life, and I hear the word of God being spoke and I know that the word of God is speaking to me and it points out something in my life, but yet my heart is unwilling to respond, I block it out and say, no, I'm going to go live my life the way I'm continuing to live it. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to change that. I'm not going to get out of my comfort zone. That's the form. That's the first form of worship. And if we will not allow our hearts to be responsive to the Spirit of God when He's speaking to us, then where are we even at? Where are we even at in our, in our worship life? The first form of worship, a responsive heart. I'm going to show you an example this morning. Flip with me to Nehemiah chapter 8. I believe this is powerful. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to start with verse 1. We're going to read through verse 3. Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. It says, all the people came together as what? One. I'm going to say that again. All the people came together as one. Can I tell you that all of those people had different preferences? <laughs> all of those people liked different things. But because of God, they were willing to come together and to be one. So they come together as one in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses. This is the word of God which the Lord had commanded for Israel. Look at verse 2. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. I'm just stopping right there. Just letting that settle in in case y'all think I'm long-winded. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon. As he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. I love that. 
I love that. They, Ezra stands up and he begins to, begins to read from the, the book of the law. He begins to read the words of God. And what happens? It says all of the people were together as one and they listened attentively. They wanted to hear. Can I say it? They wanted to hear what God had to say. That was a desire of their heart at this moment. They wanted to hear what the Lord had to say. Skip with me to verse 5. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and did what? They responded. They responded, amen, amen. Then they bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Can I tell you what the word amen means? It means truth. Truth means truth. And, and so what they're saying, they're hearing the word of God and they're declaring, that's the truth. <laughs> that's the truth. That's the truth. And then they fell on their faces before God. Look at that. They bowed down. Go back for me. They bowed down. Verse 6, I'm sorry. Verse 6. They bowed down and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Can I tell you what just happened right here? These people just heard the word of God. And it pierced their heart. And they allowed the word of God to pierce their heart. And they allowed the word of God to sit there in their spirit. And what did it do? It humbled them. Can I tell you that that's what the word of God does to me? Whenever I read the word of God, it humbles me. And it says that they bowed down. They said, that's the truth. That's the truth. And they bowed down and worshipped the Lord. They worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Because the word of God had such a convicting, piercing power and presence in their life at that moment. It showed them exactly what was going on in their hearts and in their lives. And they fell face down and worshipped. I love verse 6. I love the fact that it said they responded. Look at that. They responded. Ezra played, praised the Lord, and, they, and the people lifted their hands and responded. The first form of worship that, you, that we need is a response to the Word of God. It's a response to the Word of God. You see, as, a, as an unbeliever, I had a response to the Word of God. The day that I found Jesus, I responded to His goodness, to His Word. Now, as a believer, it's the same thing. I want to start my day off every day in God's Word, and I want my heart to respond to it. I want, I want something in my life to change. I want something in my life to, to, to mature. I want to respond to the Word of God. How do I want to respond? I want to respond humbly. We see here that it says they, they raised their hands, they shouted, Amen, Amen, and they bowed down and worshiped the Lord. They bowed down and they worshiped the Lord. Now look with me at verse 9. Verse 9, then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites were instructing the people. It said to them all, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Man, just leave that right there for me. Go back to that if you've changed it. How many times... How many times do, do we see this today? That when we read the Word of God, that it pierces us in such a way that it humbles us and we begin to, to become sorrowful. Now, listen, I, I'm thankful for the joy of the Lord. We're getting ready to read it. But I'm going to tell you that there is a proper response. That when I'm in church and I feel the Spirit of God speaking to me, my heart should allow it to speak and I should be humbled by what He has to say. A responsive heart. It's the first form of worship. They began to weep because the word of God convicted them in their life. Look at verse 10. Nehemiah said, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. For the joy of the Lord is your strength. I love this. I love this. Because after, oh my goodness, after the people heard the word of God, they began to weep, rightfully so. Because the word of God pierced their life. 
But after they accepted the word of God humbly, he said, stand up because now that you've heard the word, now that you've received the word, and now that you've responded to the word, the joy of the Lord is your strength. You have something to worship about. You have something to praise him. Because you responded and your heart was responsive to the word, you are forgiven. We can start over. Things are new. Things are different. Be joyful. Now the joy of the Lord is your strength. Those of you in here that have found that, that, that know Jesus, you know what this is saying. There was a time I can I'll never forget the day that I gave my life to Christ. You talking about you talking about sorrowful. All of a sudden, I, I've told this story. I, I wasn't at church. I was by myself, Brother Barry, by myself in the backyard. And I had this 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 CD playing on this on this on this. Boom box. I just said boom box. Lord have mercy. I had this CD playing on something. I just went mind blank, okay? And it's playing music. And I had burned this CD as a, as, a, as a younger man, and it had filthy music on it. But for somehow, some reason, there was a Christian song that had slipped in there. And it began to play this song, and I was working on this deck. And, and all of a sudden, I was hearing this music, and it was like it was the first time that I'd ever heard it. And I became, at that very moment, I felt the Holy Spirit overwhelm me and I, I began to get sorrowful because of the Word of God. I began to, to, to weep and I began to cry and I was like, Lord, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me. I want what you have for my life. I want you to be the king of my heart. I want, I, want, I want my life to be different. And can I tell you that weeping changed to joyful praising in a matter of an instant. Because as soon as I said, Lord, I want you to be the king of my heart, something in my life changed. And I was no longer mourning. I was no longer sorrowful. But I became joyful. I became joyful because I knew everything in my life that had happened was covered under the blood. And I had a fresh start. Not even a fresh start. A new beginning. That, light, that man was dead. It was brand new. And to this day, I have something to praise him about. I, I can express my love to him because of what he did for me. The first form of worship is a responsive heart. If we can't respond to the word of God in our heart, in our lives, if we can't respond to the word of God, then the, what is the worship that we give up? We're praising God and saying, oh, Lord, you're the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and I trust you and I praise you, but not with that. <laughs> don't, don't come at me like, I don't want to change nothing. I just want to sing to you. <laughs> I don't want nothing in my life to be different. I just want to sing to you. Look with me at Zach. We're going to keep going in, at, at chapter 9. I almost said Zechariah. My Bible is open to Zechariah, and I do not know why. Look at chapter 9. Chapter 9, starting with verse 1. On the, this is still this is this is a revival, by the way, that is broken out. Revival is broken out because people heard the word of God. <laughs> revival, revival, has broken out simply because the people heard the word of God. I'm just gonna leave it at that. On the twenty fourth day of the same month, the Israelites gathered together, fasting and wearing sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. Leave that there. I'm sorry. Go back to that. On the 24th day of the same month, they are still reading the Word of God. And look what it says. The Israelites gathered together again, and they began to fast. They began to fast and pray. And they began to, to wear sackcloth and putting dust on their heads. That was a symbol of being humble. They were humbling themselves to the Word of God. Look at verse 2. Those of Israelite descent had separated themselves from all foreigners. They stood in their places and did what? They confessed their sins and the sins of their ancestors. This is incredible. The word of God, the response that happened from the word of God was fasting, prayer, humbling themselves, admitting what was wrong and wanting to turn, wanting to repent, and separating themselves from the world. Can I say that again? Separating themselves from the world. We are not to separate ourselves from worldly people. We are to love we could never make an impact on somebody's life if we didn't have anything to do with them. But can I tell you this? That as Christ, as, as a child of God and as a believer, that relationship is extremely important. But I better have built myself up. And, and, and listen, if I, if, I look, 
if I look and act and talk just like the person I'm witnessing to, what are they going? We are called to be different. We are, it's okay to be different in this society. Can I say it? We are called to be separate. We are called to be separate, to be, to be different, to live on the authority of the Word of God, but then to leave and to love on people. We spend too much time trying to change people. I believe it with all of my heart. Can I say that, that maybe we just need to love people and Jesus can change them? We love, that don't, that don't mean we accept and we agree. We, we stand against, we stand on the Word of God. We stand for truth. But I, I put it on Facebook recently. There's so many pastors and Christians and people all that, that, are, that are on there arguing about, about theological issues and on there arguing about, about voting and, and on there arguing about political stuff. Ain't nobody going to come to Christ because of that. Nobody. We, we are to stand for truth, but to do it in love. I'm getting off a little bit right here. But what we see here is that it said the, is, the people of Israelite descent had separated themselves. Now we say, well, well, Pastor Dustin, that's only an Old Testament thing. Well, I'm going to read to you another Old Testament thing. Look with me at Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3, and we're going to read verses 1 through 5. I've been in the book of Joshua recently, and I, I want you to look with me. These people have come together, and they're getting ready to go take the promised land. They're getting ready. To, God said, go take possession of the land that I've given to you. <laughs> they still had to get up and go get it. You read right here, verse 1, it says, Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out and went to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Let me tell you that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark right there represented the presence and the Spirit of God. That still stands today. Every bit of that right there still stands today. When we see the presence of God moving and we see the Spirit of God moving, we need to get in with it. And we need to be a part of it. But what we see right here is it says they come to the Jordan River. Now at this time of year, there's, there's a lot of different beliefs here. But if you'll, if you'll see and study, at this time of year during this time, the, the, the Jordan River would rise so high that it was, it, was, it was just as much, about as impossible to cross as the Red Sea. We talk about the Red Sea miracle all the time. But they, they came and they camped for three days. And the reason I believe that they camped for three, this is Pastor Dustin's, this is Pastor Dustin's, this, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you what happened in the Bible and I'm telling you, I'm, I'm just, I'm prefacing it here. It's Pastor Dustin's belief. I believe they stood there for three days and looked at the Jordan River and went, how in the world are we going to get over that? How, how are we going to cross that? And then Joshua sent word throughout the camp that said the presence of God is going to lead us over it. You see, we can sit right here and look out into Sheridan and go, man, there's all kinds of things that are standing in the way. That it don't even look, it ain't even worth witnessing to that person at work. They ain't going to come to Christ. It's not even going work. It's not even worth going out and and, and and being a light and witnessing to people. These people don't want Jesus. But can I tell you this? That what's impossible with man is possible with God. And as these people sat there and camped for three days and looked at the problem, God provided the way through. And they said, either get in. Can I tell you that if there had been people in that camp, and there may have been, if there had been people in that camp that would have refused to follow the Ark of the Covenant and the Spirit of God, they'd have been left behind. They'd have stayed on this side of the river. Because God was going to provide the way, and they better get in and get behind him. And so what we see right here is it said, okay, what's impossible with man is possible with God. So when the Spirit of God begins to move, you better follow because he's going to lead you over. Now look at the next verse. Go to verse 4. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. It's because he was so holy. Now look at verse 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. Now, let's sit right there for a second. To consecrate yourself means to separate yourself. It means to separate yourself from anything that's unholy. And what Joshua right here is telling the people, <laughs> hear this please. He said, if you want God to do something big tomorrow, you better be willing to separate from the world today. Because if we're too married to the world and we're not willing to give that up, you can guarantee, you can just about bet that tomorrow morning the Joshua, the Jordan River ain't going to part. Consecrate, look what he says, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. We keep expecting revival, don't we? 
How many, how many churches and pastors and people are, are we're trying to generate revival? We're trying to, we're trying to, and we're just stamping a name on it. And, and, and what we're seeing right here is that, is that I, this is what, what I believe. If, if we want the Lord to do a revival in the hearts of our people tomorrow, if we want the Lord to do a revival in our community tomorrow, I believe God's people need to be willing to say, Lord, I'm giving myself totally over to you. I'm giving it all to you. I'm giving you all of my heart. I'm going to worship you for who you are. I know that the, I know that, that I've got, I know that the word tells me to do, we talked about it last week, going wholehearted. That every decision that you make that's based on the word of God, the enemy is going to provide a giant that you're going to have to defeat. I said it last week. We, oh, well, I, I know the word of God tells me to give the first 10%, but I got too many bills due this week. Are we living by faith or are we living by sight? It, that's in every aspect of our life. Every decision we make for God, there's going to be a giant that the enemy is going to put in front of your face. And so what am I telling you here? I'm saying that we as God's people, we as God's people need to be willing to consecrate ourselves. We need to be willing to be separate. If we're going to go, listen to this please, if we're going to go where we need to go from where we are, we need to be willing to be separate. We need to be willing to give ourselves to the Lord. The first form of worship, Jesus, I'm all yours. Say it with me. Jesus is I'm all yours. Romans chapter 15 verse 4 tells us that everything that's written in the past is to teach us. You see, we live under a new covenant. Aren't y'all thankful for that? I'm thankful, man, that that I don't live under the law anymore. This is not about legalism in the law. This is about my proper response to God's love. You see, the Lord shed, Jesus shed his blood for me. And there is a proper response, my goodness. I want to give him everything that I've got. I want Jesus. If you're in here, you don't have to raise your hand. Ask yourself this. Do do you want Jesus more than you want worldly fame? Do you want Jesus more than you want worldly finances? Do you want Jesus more more than than you want that relationship? what, What do you want? What do we desire in our life? As a child of God, we are, I'm going to stand on it. I'm not, as a child of God, we, I hope we desire Jesus over everything. It's about him. It's about Jesus. My life is about Jesus. You may say, well, Pastor Dustin, you're, you're a pastor. I'm here to tell you, your life is called to be about Jesus too. I will never reach this community by myself, ever. It takes, it takes a group of believers that are willing to come together as one and say the word of God is the authority in my life and I want him over everything. My life is going to worship him. Look with me at Luke chapter 11. I'm almost done. If the worship team will come. Luke chapter 11. Look with me real quick. Verses 14 through 16. As Jesus was, say, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, The man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. But some of them said, By Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Others asked him for a sign from heaven. Stick with me. Others asked him uh, for a sign from heaven. I believe that my God's still a miracle worker. But that's why I always get ruffled a little bit and my a red flag goes up whenever we are seeking a miracle from God more than we're seeking the Spirit of God and the presence of God and more than we're seeking the, the holiness of God and separation as believers. Others tested him by asking for a sign from heaven. Now, in the same conversation, go with me to verse 27. I want you to see what, what happens here. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. And look at Jesus' response. He said, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. This is Jesus. This is not Pastor Dustin. This is Jesus. Jesus said, Blessed are they that hear the word and obey it. That's the first form of worship. Blessed are they. Those who not only hear the word of God, but when they hear the word of God, they allow it to pierce their heart. They allow it to humble them. And they allow themselves to be all in and to give themselves over to Jesus. They hear and they obey. Matthew 15, 7 through 9. Look at this. I said, I I referenced it earlier. Jesus says, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. 
These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. He said, you worship me in vain. Why did they worship him in vain? Because their hearts were far from him. They didn't love him. The worship wasn't coming from a love that was, that was within, from a desire that was within. You see, they had a concern for other things. They had a concern for their image. They had a concern for their style. They had a concern for their preference. They wanted to look holier than everybody. They were so concerned with what the world thought that they forgot to love Christ. And the love for Jesus ran cold. And he said, the words that you're lifting up to me, your worship's in vain. Because it don't come from your heart. What is worship? It's love expressed. Why, why do I worship? Why do I lift my hands? It's love expressed. Why, it, why it's not, listen to me. Why when, why, why when I'm given the opportunity to do something that's wrong that nobody would ever know about but myself? I'm going to say it one more time. You don't, I, I'm, saying it, I'm not saying it because I want to amen. I'm saying it because I want you to hear this. It's not legalism. Why, when I'm given the opportunity to do something against the Word of God and nobody would ever know but me, why does something inside of me go, no? I'm going to stand whole, I'm going to stand firm. It's not because I'm scared. It's not because of legalism. It's because I love Jesus. It's the proper response. There's my worship. Why do I worship Him in that way? That's a form of worship. Why do I write that check every month? <laughs> Not because I got plenty of money, I promise you. It's because I trust him and I love him. And I want to do what his word says because I'm submitted to him. It's about worship. We see here, we talk about revival, revival, revival. And you look in Nehemiah chapter 8, and let me show you the things that led to this revival. There was an emphasis on the word of God. The people came together as one. They praised and worshiped the Lord. They confessed their sins. They received Him humbly. They rejected sin. They, they were separate. And they, 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 they said, we don't want anything to do with that. And then in chapter 10, we're not even going to go there. They renewed their commitment to the Lord. There's a response of our heart. That's the first form of worship. The last scripture. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to read verse 14 and then verse 17. Look what, look, what, look, what, look what Paul writes here to the church. He says, do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? He says, do not, if you read King James Version, I believe it says, do not be unequally yoked. Do not be unequally yoked. Let me tell you why. Listen to me. First of all, so many people take that, that scripture out of context and use that towards inter, interracial marriage. It, shame on us if we do that because that is not what the word is talking about. Just going to leave it at that. That's us taking the word of God and, and forming it to fit what we want to say. What this says is do not be yoked together with unbelievers. Listen. If I'm running my race, see, to be yoked, it means to put a collar around your neck, basically. And so let's say I've got a, I've got a chariot or I've got a horse and buggy and I'm getting ready to yoke two horses together. If one of them is a, is a thoroughbred racer and the other one is a miniature horse, am I going to have a problem? Absolutely. Absolutely. You see, we love unbelievers. We love the people of the world. But we have to be careful to not let our, our, our beliefs and our values and our morals be anything like the world. Because we're running a different race. We're running a race that sin will entangle us. Now, now, again, this morning, if this is your first time here, let me tell you, this pastor that's talking to you is very imperfect. I call on the name of the Lord all the time and say, Lord, forgive me. Not because I've lost my salvation, but because I love him. You see, I love Jennifer. And if I do something that hurts her, what do I do? I ask for forgiveness. Because that's the proper response. That's, that's my first worship. As I say, Lord, I want to live for you. I want to give it all over to you. I'm hungry for what you have, and I want to submit my life to you. Look at verse 17. Therefore, come out and be separate, says the Lord. Touch no unclean thing, and I will receive you. Paul here is quoting from the Old Testament. He says, be separate. Be separate. 
We as believers, it's time, I've said this so many times just in the last year, but, but it's time for believers to stand on the Word of God and for us to say, I want to be a man of God. I want to be a Psalm 47 man that claps for God, that sings praises to the Lord, that trusts Him, and I believe that His Word is true. My first form of worship is a receptive heart. So this morning, do we receive this word? How do we receive it? I believe all of you in here would raise your hand and say, yes, I want to live. I, I want to go all in with Jesus. I want everything in my life to be about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We have that, we have that decision to make. We can make that decision. This is what we're going to do as they just play. I'm going to ask you, everyone that's willing, I'm going to ask you to step forward. We're going to take communion this morning. You don't have to be a part of our church. You don't have to be a member. That's between you and the Lord. But we invite you to come and take communion where we worship Him and we thank Him for what He did on the cross. He gave up His body. He gave up His life. He gave up His blood. He shed His blood for us. So what we're going to do is, is 